Coming to you from Beaumont, this is your house call. The year 2020 is finally in the books, and our first two COVID vaccines, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, have finally arrived. The internet and TV news stations are loaded with photos of, and videos of frontline healthcare workers and critical infrastructure workers and other people over the age of 65 getting their vaccines and looking all excited while doing so. But as the vaccine begins to seek a broader audience, many questions are still remaining, including questions about the distribution of the vaccine, but also questions about the vaccine itself. Don't go anywhere. The House Call podcast is going in-depth on the COVID vaccine rollout. Hello and welcome to the Beaumont House Call podcast. I'm Dr. Nick Gilpin. And I'm Dr. Asha Shahjahan. We're here to help you and your family live smarter and healthier lives. That's right. And this is our second podcast that focuses on the COVID-19 vaccines. In the first podcast, Dr. Matt Sims and I talked about the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Today, Dr. Asha Shahjahan and I are going to dive in a little deeper, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the distribution and the rollout of the COVID vaccine to the public. Yep, Nick and I will be addressing some of the frequently asked questions about the vaccine. And then also we'll kind of give an overview of like where we currently stand with vaccine distribution. I think it's important as we have this conversation to timestamp some of this information. And Dr. Sims and I did that in our last podcast as well, because we recognize that things are changing very quickly. And as we sit here today, we're having this conversation. It's January 22nd. Joe Biden um, was just inaugurated two days ago. We expect that things are going to be changing probably with vaccine distribution in the coming days or weeks, but we're going to do our best to try to keep this information as current as possible. Do you want to start off with just giving us a quick recap of what we've kind of done so far with vaccine distribution, at least in the state of Michigan? Like, where are we at? Of course. I think... um, you know, stepping back a, a little bit over the, a month or so ago, vaccines began uh, with distribution on December 14th, and that was with what we call Phase 1A. That was healthcare workers and residents of long-term care facilities. And then in around mid-January, um, that was expanded to include other critical infrastructure workers, so not healthcare workers, but say police officers, firefighters, um, dentists, other people with those sort of frontline uh, occupations, and persons over the age of 65. And these phases were determined by the CDC, correct? That's right. And so you, what you'll frequently hear, public health authorities and hospitals will say that we're following CDC guidance or we're following state and federal guidance. And that's what they're meaning. They're, they're saying that they've been given these phases, they've been given a little bit of latitude to work within those phases, but really the phasing is very prescriptive. Right, because we're trying to get those high-risk individuals vaccinated first. That's right. Now, across the nation, as of a couple of days ago, as of around, say, mid-January, about 17 million doses have been administered to uh, healthcare workers and persons over the age of 65. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It, it really is. And that's according to Bloomberg.com. So good numbers so far in a relatively short amount of time. If you boil that down a little bit to Michigan, Michigan michigan.gov has a very nice um, website set up. Um, 1.1 million doses of the vaccine have so far been distributed. About half of those doses have been administered so far. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why there's a little bit of a gap there between what's been distributed and what's administered is because a lot of these doses may have been scheduled, but just not yet given. And so there's a little bit of a lag between when the clinic gets the vaccine and when it actually ends up in someone's arm. Yeah, and I think that's been really frustrating for, I know, for my patients, but we can get into that in a little bit. Yeah, because there are gaps, right? There's certainly are gaps and some challenges that we're facing, and you're absolutely right. We need to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I will say this, you know, at a high level, those gaps in distribution and administration are being worked on furiously at the local level. And by local, I mean public health, I mean hospitals, and also at the state and federal levels. Um, Now, getting even further down, Beaumont, you know, the hospital, the healthcare system that we work for, 
has administered vaccine to about half of our employees so far. Again, this is pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's been amazing. I think we've done a great job with our vaccine rollout um, and the number of people that are willing to get the vaccine. They seem to be relatively enthusiastic. Yes, and considering that this has not been a mandated vaccine, really, this is just this is an education campaign. We want our people to get vaccinated. We want to educate our people to make good choices, but we really don't have the authority at this time to mandate it. So the fact that we're still getting good uptake of the vaccine with our own healthcare workers, to me, is a good thing. I agree. So that's a little bit about the distribution timeline. Um, Asha, I'm curious what you're seeing in your clinical practice. What are your patients asking you or what are you talking about? Yeah, so I think in general, there is an overall excitement around the vaccine. I think people are relieved and many are anxiously waiting for their turn, but there is a hesitancy. So when I say vaccine hesitancy, what I mean is people want to get the vaccine, but they're just kind of nervous about going first, or they want to wait a little bit longer to see what happens with other people or other people taking it. They just want it to be out a little bit longer. So I've noticed that with my patients, almost every patient since the vaccines come out, I've, it, there's a conversation about the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I did have an essential worker who was offered the vaccine and she actually declined. And, you know, we were talking and I said, oh, my gosh, why did you decline? You got a chance to get the vaccine. And she said, you know, I'm just I'm just not sure yet. And I think that's a perfect opportunity for, um, you know, physicians to really step in and educate the public. And so I was talking to her about the vaccine and she happens to be a, a woman of color. She's a black American. And her concern was that, you know, she said, I don't know if I'm really represented. I don't know. Um, a lot about this vaccine, and I just have a lot of distrust towards the medical system, which I completely understand. You know, in the past, we've had um, the Henrietta Lacks um, situation and the Tuskegee trial, and there's been so many injustices around uh, research uh, in healthcare, and we have to kind of own up to that as, as healthcare providers. But what I told her was what's happened, you know, over, over time is that we've evolved and we've really worked on health equity. And I think that this vaccine, uh, particularly the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, have done an excellent job uh, in terms of their diversity. So I told her, for example, you know, Pfizer has 41% of its population um, being from diverse backgrounds, and 10% of the participants in the study were black, and 26% were Latinx. When you look at Moderna, 37% of its um, population was diverse uh, from diverse backgrounds, and again, 10% were black, and about 20% were Latinx. So I was like, you know, from a sample size, definitely there was diversity and included, and especially um, black Americans. Um, and then I even talked to her about the whole development of the vaccine. You know, we know that uh, Dr. Corbett, like she is a woman of color and she was one of the lead uh, scientists, researchers, immunologists that worked on the vaccine. So what I told her was every step of the vaccine, whether it was in the development, whether it was in the trials or whether with, of the delivery of the vaccine, there were people of color that were represented and part of this amazing process. And after the end of that conversation, you know, she said, you know what, I think I'm going to go ahead and get the vaccine. So I think just having those conversations um, where people are hesitant and kind of finding out what, why are you hesitant and being able to explain that and then letting people make their own decision of whether or not they want to take the vaccine. Wow, you summed it up so well. I, I'm really glad you mentioned specifically about Pfizer and Moderna and their trials and, and how they really worked hard to make sure that their um, that their sample was diverse and inclusive. Right. I think the next step here, and I've had a lot of conversations with um, officials from, from the state and from public health departments, is making sure that we're getting the vaccine into those communities of color, getting the vaccine, you know, bring the vaccine to the people. Absolutely. And and I know that's going to be, right now that is a challenge. That's one of our infrastructure challenges. In a, just a little bit, we can talk more about what that might look like in the future, but I know that that's one of the big pushes for the state is to um, bring in more assistance if necessary, whether that's the National Guard or whether that's volunteers or whoever that might be, but getting the vaccine into those communities where people live and work is going to really improve uptake. I think that's going to be huge. Yeah, and I also think just um, people being informed. So having more town halls uh, available for people. So I'll give an example. So I'm part of this um, this coalition of physicians, um, it, and it's called hashtag this is our shot. 
And what it is, it's a provider-run organization that's really providing um, education on misinformation around the vaccine and really trying to promote vaccine uptake from a physician lens. And we know from research, from several research studies, that physicians are the most trusted resource uh, when it comes to information about the vaccine. So, you know, if you look at this study, they talk about um, politicians, they talk about government officials, they talk about Dr. Fauci even. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the primary care physician actually trumps all of them. So, it's uh, interesting in the fact that we need to put more primary care providers uh, in front of people so that they can talk and get their questions answered. And I think it's really important to encourage people from who are from the communities that you're from. So people that look like you have shared the same experiences as, as you being able to answer your questions. And I think that the town halls that many physicians have been doing have been fantastic. Weird question. Huh? Do you think it would help to have more say, non-science folks, celebrities, athletes, famous people, do you think it would help to have more of a voice there advocating for this vaccine? So actually, it depends. So if you look at the research that's been done, the research says that the least trusted person when it comes to information about the vaccine is celebrities. Um, The most trusted is your family physician. But if you're looking at things in terms of promotion and the sense of uh, people feeling like, oh, this person's getting it, I think you know celebrities might be a great uh, way of advocating. But I think when it comes to making your decision around information, yeah. so like what are the side effects, the research has shown that people trust their doctors over celebrities. So I think, you know, although I, you know, I love the fact that a lot of celebrities are like tweeting and, you know, kind of. Uh, showing their support for the vaccine, I think that's great. That's what we all need to do. But I do think that when it comes to getting reliable information, it, the doctor that knows you best is your primary care doctor. They understand your past medical history. They know about your family, your community. And that would be the most trusted source, I think, to get your information. Yeah. Appreciate that. So let's talk about some of the current gaps and struggles. So as I mentioned, some of my patients have been really frustrated, especially those that are 65 and older, about the process of trying to get the vaccine. Yes. So it's becoming a struggle for, I think, a lot of the elderly population, for one, trying to get a ride to get to their vaccine. Um, if they've got, if they're a caregiver for their spouse, it's like they have to find someone to watch their spouse. In my situation, you know, I've mentioned this before, my mom's got uh, dementia, my father's over 65. And it's like, if he needs to go for a vaccine appointment, he has to make sure I'm available to take care of my mom. So there's a lot of planning that needs to go around it for the community. But yet it's like this almost like a lottery system. And it's like when your ticket's up, you want to just run and get it. So I think that's been frustrating. So Nick, can you talk a little bit about like, what are some of the, you know, the gaps that you're seeing and the struggles that you're seeing and um, ways that those are being kind of overcome? Well, you talked a little bit about hesitancy, and I think that's an extremely important piece here. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move a little bit beyond hesitancy, and I'm going to put this into two buckets. Okay. And one of those buckets right now is about supply. So without enough vaccine supply, clearly we're not going to be able to vaccine enough people. And we know right now that we are dealing with some supply limitations. Michigan, speaking you know, about the state that we live in, gets around 60,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine per week. That's hardly anything, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Beaumont, the hospital we work for, has the capacity to vaccinate up to 50,000 people per week, but we're not getting nearly that much vaccine because the state's only allocated 60,000 doses per week. So that's a huge bottleneck for us right now. Now, how is that being addressed? Well, the hope is that you know, over the next couple of weeks, there's going to be an increase in supply that, you know, that, that uh, manufacturers are going to release more of their stockpile of vaccine. There's going to be a bolus of this vaccine administered mm, out to the, so. <laughs> to the communities. The other issue is the Moderna vaccine, which has really been earmarked primarily for long-term care facilities. They're going to start to pull that, you know, they're, they're saying, okay, long-term care facilities, you've gotten a good amount of vaccine so far we're going to pivot and we're going to move some of that vaccine now to public health and hospitals. So the overarching goal here is that there will be more supply available in the next coming weeks, and that'll ease some of those bottlenecks that we're talking about. So question. So Mm -hmm. one of the Um, you know, with the new administration, there's been, uh, you know, a lot of executive orders signed, et cetera. And like one of the uh, so-called promises are, or goals, I guess, is 100 million vaccines in 100 days. Do you think, one, is that enough? 
you know, and two, is that a realistic goal? I do. I really do. So the population of the United States is over 300 million people. If we get 100 million people vaccinated, that's a pretty good start. Um, I think when we get to that point, then we're going to start to have additional challenges. You know, we're going to start to hit a wall. And then we're going to have to figure out how to push past that wall because it's going to be difficult to get to that magic number of 70 or 75 or 80 percent, whatever that magic number may be for so-called herd immunity. And we can certainly talk about what that world is going to look like. Um, So, yeah, short answer, yes, I think it's an achievable goal. It's going to take a lot of doing and not only on the supply side, but now we got to talk about the infrastructure side. So those things that you were talking about, about your um, your patients who are elderly, your patients who may not be as tech savvy or may not have um, a, a, the ability to get to a vaccine site to get administered the vaccine, those are infrastructure problems. And so to fix those problems, we need more access, we need more sites, we need more staff to deliver vaccines. Yeah. Staff doesn't grow on trees. You've heard me talk about this many times on this podcast. So how are we going to get more of that? Well, I think one of the ideas here is that the Biden administration has talked about and the state has talked about um, opening up FEMA Mm -hmm. and the National Guard to help administer some of these vaccines. And I think that that would be certainly a step in the right direction. Yeah, I I think absolutely. That's the thing. It seems like people are interested. They want to get the vaccine. And the frustration currently is that I want to get it, but I can't get it right now. And what's happening with that? And there, like you said, there's the two buckets. There's the second bucket of people that, um, you know, just don't want to get the vaccine at all. But I think, it, in my opinion, at this point, is let's focus on the people that want to get the vaccine, are eligible to get the vaccine, and let's get those vaccine in their arms. One of the other interesting groups that I um, spend a lot of time with is is a group of uh, ethicists, mm-hmm. and we talk about the fair an equitable distribution of the vaccine and what does that look like? And that's something that's really been a challenge for us because anytime you're allocating a scarce resource, um, there's going to be some ethical questions and concerns. I believe that our distribution of the vaccine, speaking of Beaumont right now, has been fair and equitable. The lottery system is, you know, for all its warts and imperfections, I think it's a pretty good system. Um, But some of the challenges that we've faced you know, again, not everybody has a computer. Not everybody right. has the the ability to log into my chart and and schedule a vaccine. So we've tried to open up call centers to make it more accessible for people. Um, you know, to go a step further and address some of those inequities, I think that's going to take more infrastructure. We're going to have to bring that vaccine into those communities to help get it out to those people. And I think some of it has to do with messaging, because I know there's a lot of confusion of, do I get this from my doctor's office? Do I get it from my employer? Can I go to, you know, a drugstore, pharmaceutical, like a CVS or a Meyer? Um, people are confused as to where to go. And they're like, do I need to get on a list somewhere? Um, and then, again, when we talk about equity, it's like there's people that are visually impaired. There's people with various, mm-hmm. you know, disabilities um, that have access issues. So we really have to think through this, not only as healthcare providers, but I think as leaders uh, in the space of vaccine distribution. And hopefully we will do it right. Agree. You know, and my, my other ask of people listening right now is patience. I, I think we are we are doing a good job. I think there's more that can be done. I think some of these issues, some of these supply and infrastructure issues will be resolved with time, and I think we're moving in the right direction. Okay, so let's pivot to some commonly asked questions. You get these questions, I get these questions. Um, I think it's important to, to just provide a forum for answering some of these frequently asked questions. First up, one question I get a lot is, What do we know about how long these vaccines last? Asha, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, it's not 100% clear as of yet because it's still sort of being studied in terms of how long your immunity lasts for. Um, The FDA has been saying it's at least three months. um, And some of the experts are sort of looking at the fact that it could possibly be you know, up to two to three years or maybe more. So I think it just depends. And at this point, we don't really have an answer. The one thing we do have an answer for is that if you recently did have COVID-19 um, and you, or you tested positive for your antibodies or your infection was within 90 days, you can probably wait that 90-day period before getting your vaccine. And that's actually probably recommended. Uh, one, because you probably won't mount as great of an immune response um, if you just recently had the infection as opposed to 
you know, um, getting it later on when the antibodies have worn off. Um, but I think that's kind of the thing where we're at. So at this point, if you've had COVID-19 and it's been more than 90 days, then go ahead and get vaccinated. Um, if you get vaccinated, we don't know yet how long it's going to last for, but at, at least we know it's most likely three months and m- possibly more. Yeah. And I've heard both manufacturers have come out and said that they expect the immunity to the, from this vaccine to last at least a couple of years. It's kind of an unfair question, really, because those studies that were done only lasted three months. These, these vaccines have really only existed for a few months. So there is still a lot about these vaccines that we don't know. One thing we do know is that the immunity that you get from these vaccines does seem to be pretty impressive. Right. And so based on that, extrapolating that out, we believe that immunity is going to last a while. Do you think that natural uh, natural immunity versus vaccine immunity, like there is a big difference, because, uh, you know, in terms of if you had the infection naturally, um, again, we're saying that it seems like within three months or so it kind of wanes off, whereas the vaccine immunity may last longer. Can you speak to that? This is interesting, really, because this is this defies convention for infectious diseases in general. Normally, we've been taught, I've been taught, that when you get the infection, the immunity that you get from it tends to last longer than vaccine immunity. Mm-hmm. This seems to be different, and it, I believe it has a lot to do with the mRNA technology that's used to make these uh, vaccines. It gives a very robust immune response and um, triggers you know, antibody levels that are even higher than those of natural infection. There's now studies coming out saying immunity from natural infection might last 90 days, five months, eight months, maybe a year, whereas we're projecting that immunity from the vaccine could what last well over a year, maybe two, three years, maybe even longer than that. That would be great. Um, but it also makes me wonder then about like AstraZeneca or uh, Johnson & Johnson mm-hmm. vaccines that are non-mRNA vaccines. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, there are people that live in other countries and come over, or we don't know what else is going to be available later on down the line in the United States. So it's just something to think about, I guess, in terms of if you were to get a Johnson & Johnson, which is like the um, adenovirus um, that's right. vaccine. Um, single or, dose. Right. That's I mean, that's the good thing about it is a single dose. Mm-hmm. But again, I'm just wondering about when you think about that natural immunity, what what is what is behind that? Absolutely. A lot of unanswered questions for sure. Next question I hear a lot is, how long after I get my vaccine can I expect this protection to kick in, particularly after both doses? Yeah, so I think it, what it's looking like is about seven to 10 days is when you start building that immune response. So after you get the first dose, with probably between seven and 10 days, you might be about 50 to 53% protected. And then once you get the second dose, about seven to 10 days later, um, we're, we're hoping that you get about 90 to 95% um, in, immunity. Uh, again, this is like a range. So I know there's some people that they get their vaccine and they're posting on Facebook, I'm immune, I'm ready to go. And it's like, not yet. (laughs) Bingo. I think really important point. And I've seen some articles in the news media come out showing that there is an alarming rate of new infections in people after getting the first dose of the vaccine. So between the first and the second dose, There are a lot of reports. One article I read particularly was out of Israel. Mm. A lot of people getting sick with COVID in between their first and second dose. Why is that? Does it mean the vaccine is failing? I don't believe so. I believe what it really means is that you've got a lot of people getting vaccinated and having a a misconception, a pervasive misconception, that they're somehow now protected or have more protection than they may actually have. And then not doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, like wearing masks and social distancing. So I think people need to keep it in their minds that the full protection of the vaccine really doesn't occur until after the second dose and even about a week or week and a half after that. Yeah, and then even so, it's still important to continue to mask and social distance and hand wash. 100%. Because we're not 100% sure about um, transmission still. Yes. So even though you're vaccinated, you could still you know, transmit the virus uh, potentially. So I think there's, you know, until we get to that, you know, 70 to 80% herd immunity, which, you know, does mean vaccinated people, 70 to 80% of people vaccinated, we can't really let our guards down. Totally. Completely agree. All right, let's talk variants. So big news, variants are all over the place. Um, There's variants in Michigan, there's variants in the United States, there's variants in UK, Germany, South Africa, Nigeria. Um, 
So there's a lot of concern that these variants may impact the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, are the vaccines, as far as we know, still effective against these variant strains? Right. So as far as we know, currently they are. Um, the vaccines have still been proven to be effective. And, and I think the one thing about it is that if by any chance in the future um, these variants continue to modify themselves even more and more, hmm. with the mRNA technology, it's very easy to um, sort of um, adapt the vaccine in the future to these variants. So I, I'm not too concerned about the variants as much. I mean, I think the biggest concerning factor is that uh, it seems to be more infectious. People are getting, it's more contagious um, or people are getting infected easier. So I think mm -hmm. that's just something to be concerned about in terms of, uh, you know, social distancing, hand washing and all of that. But I think in terms of the vaccine, I think we should be okay. Totally agree, well said. One point I want to add to that is when you hear about variants, I think an important thing for the public to be aware of is variants are going to happen, right? They're, the virus is going to mutate. And an important question you have to ask every time you hear about a new variant is, is it fundamentally different than the so-called garden variety strain? Mm -hmm. Is it more deadly? Is it more transmissible? Does it affect how the vaccine works? Because most of the variants out there have no bearing on how the vax, or excuse me, how the virus functions. And it really is no different than any other virus that's out there. So um, just keep that in mind when you read about these variants. It can be a lot of scary media and yeah. the word mutant variant, whatever, can right. conjure up some, you know, dark images, but a lot of these variants are really NBD. I think that's really reassuring to know. All right, next question. Um, can I choose which vaccine I get to receive? So, you know, we've got Pfizer, we've got Moderna. Probably in another month or two, we'll have more vaccines. Yeah, so I think at this point, you really can't choose. Um, it's basically first come, the first availability that you get to get a vaccine, I would recommend to just get that vaccine. The one thing to know is that if it is a two-dose vaccine, that you should get the same vaccine. You shouldn't be mixing, like going getting a Pfizer and then a Moderna. But it appears that most centers are getting like one type of vaccine. So, you know, for example, here at Beaumont, we were doing Pfizer. Um, at other places, they might be doing Moderna. So I think at this point, they're all pretty much the same. Yes. So one is really not better than another in terms of protecting you. So I would say any the, vac the first chance you get to get a vaccine, take it. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, now, another question, I'm going to piggyback on that one is, the difference between Pfizer and Moderna is 21 days for Pfizer, 28 days for Moderna in, in terms of the gap between dose one and dose two. Another commonly asked question I get is, okay, I want to get that vaccine, but gosh, looking three weeks out or four weeks out, you know, I may not be available at that time. I might have this or that. How much latitude do we have with that second dose? Yeah, so I think the CDC just recently um, stated that you probably have about a four-week gap. And correct me if I'm wrong. That's right. So I think it's a four-week gap. So before they were really staunch about the 21 days for the Pfizer and 28 for Moderna. Um, and again, that's because that's how the studies were done. But I think as they're looking at um, different cases that you can technically still be okay within a four-week gap. There's precedent here with other vaccines too. In general, we, we like to give vaccines on schedule giving vaccines earlier than scheduled, generally not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't go earlier than the 21 days or the 28 days for your scheduled mm -hmm. vaccine. But if you need to push it back a week or two, or even as many as four weeks, even up to a month longer than what you're scheduled, it's probably not going to compromise the effectiveness of the vaccine. You're still going to mount a very good immune response. We don't want to get too far beyond that because then we start playing with science and data and we don't really have all that information at our disposal right now. But generally speaking, it really shouldn't compromise the effectiveness. And we recognize that people, you know, circumstances happen. Sometimes people get COVID after their first dose. They don't want to get the second dose necessarily because they're still feeling sick mm -hmm. or because they have to, you know, go visit relatives somewhere or something comes up on their work schedule or whatever. There's a million different reasons. But just rest assured, it's probably safe if you have to reschedule a couple of weeks out. Yeah, that's good to know. Another one that's very, very topical, and I get so many questions about this, has to do with the vaccine in pregnancy and in breastfeeding or people who want to become pregnant. Talk about the safety of the vaccine in those situations, if you can. Yeah, so actually, in the Washington Post just on Tuesday, uh, they released that um, Israel for their guidelines, they've actually recommended that all pregnant women, especially pregnant women who have pre-existing conditions, to go ahead and get the vaccine. 
Uh, here in the United States, um, the American College of Gynecology and the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, they both feel that the vaccine is safe and effective in pregnancy and that it shouldn't be withheld from anyone that wants to get the vaccine. But they also recognize the fact that the data that's available is, a, is limited. And the reason why is the, the first uh, phase of the trial excluded pregnant women. Um, and the reason for that is that's a very common thing when you have clinical trials. We try to avoid vulnerable populations, and pregnant women and children are considered vulnerable populations. And therefore, they're usually not included in any first trial or first phase uh, of a trial. So it's not necessarily that they thought it was um, you know, not good for pregnant patients, that they were excluded, but they were excluded. So we recognize that as providers. And so with the limited data, you know, it's really a personal choice whether you want to get the vaccine or not. But there is a lot of precedence around vaccines, as you mentioned, uh, you know, like uh, the tetanus vaccine, uh, the influenza vaccine, uh, uh, they're usually better to give to pregnant patients. And that we also know that people who are pregnant who end up actually contracting the COVID virus tend to do a lot worse than the general public. So those are some things about in terms of pregnancy. You mentioned fertility, and there's no evidence that taking the vaccine affects your fertility. Uh, in fact, I think in one of the main studies, there they were asking people not to get pregnant during the trial, and there was actually I think uh, at least five or five or six people who ended up getting pregnant in the trial, and, and so far their pregnancies are doing fine. So that's the other thing in terms of fertility. And then the third question you asked was regarding you know, breastfeeding. And I think that the interesting thing about breastfeeding is that although, again, we don't have a lot of data around it, it, it appears that if you're breastfeeding, the antibodies that you have uh, against the virus could possibly be transmitted to the baby, which is a good thing. So you're kind of protecting your baby as well. Um, so, and, and one thing to remember also is, again, if you're getting you know, the Pfizer or Moderna, these are mRNA vaccines. That means they're not injecting live virus or uh, weakened virus into you. And so there's no way that you can get the COVID-19 virus from the vaccine. And in addition to that, the ingredients that are in these vaccines are known, are known that there are no harmful elements to pregnant women or to a fetus. Um, so looking at the ingredients, looking at the fact that it's an mRNA vaccine, looking at the prior evidence of previous vaccines that are similar, it appears to be relatively safe. Yeah, we are absolutely allowing any of our healthcare workers who are pregnant. Um, we are, you know, we're giving them the same informed consent form to uh, to review. We're counseling them. We're telling them that they can speak with their obstetricians. Um, but we are absolutely not withholding vaccine on the basis of pregnancy or breastfeeding. We still think it's a good idea. This is, as you said, supported by all the major societies. Yeah, and I think also um, there is this, there is current studies going on now, so I, I do think that include pregnant women. So I do think in the near future you'll get a more definitive answer. Yep. Um, so what are your thoughts in terms of you know the question of like we mentioned, are masks still ne necessary after getting vaccinated? And yeah. Why or why not? Yep. So you kind of you teased this one a little bit earlier, and the answer is yes, and it has everything to do with transmission. So again, we know that the vaccine does a very good job of preventing disease, but we're still not completely sure about transmission. So let's imagine a, a possibility where, um, you know, I'm vaccinated. Um, for whatever reason, I'm not wearing a mask, I encounter someone who has COVID, I could potentially harbor the virus in my nose or upper airways or whatever. I will not get sick from it. At least I shouldn't get sick from it because the vaccine is very effective, but I could potentially pass that on to others. And that's something I absolutely want to avoid. So common question I get asked, healthcare workers, hey, I got my vaccine. Does that mean I have to keep wearing masks when I see my patients? Does that mean I can go visit grandma? Does that mean I can go do this? Short answer right now is you should continue to do all the things that we've been preaching, masking, social distancing, hand hygiene, until we get more information about transmission. It's funny that you say that. So this morning I was in clinic and um, there was a fellow healthcare worker who I hadn't seen in a really long time. And she had walked in and, and we were both masked, but she came running up to me to give me this big hug. And I was like, air hugs. And I kind of like pushed her back. And she's like, well, I'm vaccinated. Aren't you vaccinated? I said, I am vaccinated. She's like, so what's the big deal? And I said, I've got elderly parents that I see every weekend mm. and I'm not taking any <laughs> chances. So it was kind of like this moment where it's like, oh yeah, we're both vaccinated, but still it's like, you have to take that precaution. Well, we can think of, there's lots of scenarios and I've been posed, you know, 
it's like a game people like to play with me. Like, okay, I'm going to do this and my friend's going to do that. And is it okay? So let me just walk through a couple of these. Like, so one I get a lot is, okay, I'm vaccinated. My wife, my, you know, friend, we're vaccinated. We want to go out to a bar together. Is that a good idea? I would say to them, sure, you can go to a bar, you can go to a restaurant. You know, in Michigan, we're talking about restaurants and bars opening up soon guess what? You're going to wear a mask, you know? And then when you get to the restaurant, you get seated at your table, you can take your mask off like everybody else. The risk to you of getting COVID disease is low, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't perhaps pick it up and then transmit it to others. So you still got to do the stuff, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Another one I get is grandparents, right? So, you know, grandma and grandpa got vaccinated. Now can I let them come over and, and see their grandkids? Same rules apply, right? Still got to wear the mask, still got to take the precautions. Grandma and grandpa probably aren't going to get sick. At least 95% effectiveness not going to get sick. But remember, there's still 95% ain't 100%. Right. There's still an outside chance that they could get COVID. And we certainly don't want that to happen to grandma and grandpa. We also don't want grandma and grandpa to pick up COVID and then perhaps spread it to others. So again, still got to do the masks, still got to do all the things. I think that's important. You and I were talking before the podcast, and you're talking about going on a trip somewhere. Yes. You want to talk so, about that? I mean, you guys know I travel like pre-COVID. I travel probably every month somewhere, and I usually try to do two or three international trips. That's like my norm. So this this period of COVID has been really hard. I have not left the state you know, since the start of the pandemic because um, I just didn't feel like it was safe. So now I've been vaccinated with both doses and my birthday's coming up. (laughs) So um, I was thinking, I was like, you know what? I really just want to get away for a little bit. Uh, And I have a a colleague who's also been vaccinated that, you know, has a condo down in Florida. So I thought about it and I said, you know what? I think I'm going to go ahead and go on a trip to Florida. This is the first time I'm going to be boarding a plane. So I was looking at all the, uh, you know, the different airlines, and I chose an airline that still um, is keeping very good with their COVID precautions in the sense that they keep the middle seat empty um, and they're at half capacity. So, and I also had a friend that did travel for work through that airline and said they did a fantastic job with having, you know, hand sanitizer at every single section. Um, masks are required. So if, when I get on this flight, my plan is I am going to be wearing my mask. I will be wearing my face shield and. I booked a seat that was at the window, so I don't have anyone sitting next to me. Um, The plan is once I get there, my friend is coming to pick me up, and we're going straight to her condo and probably just going to be hanging out outdoors. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, and I'll be masking indoors in her house. So I think, again, we're still doing the social distancing guidelines, um, following all the precautions, as you mentioned, same as going to a bar. Mm -hmm. I am not traveling to Europe anytime soon, unfortunately. I did have a trip to Berlin that was planned that got canceled just because it's still not quite safe uh, to travel abroad because of the the way the infection is appearing in other countries. Yeah. So, you know, my advice, if you want to go on a trip international or sorry, nationally within the country road trip, or if you're going to take an airplane, make sure that they're following you know, precautions. It's not a jam packed airplane where you're sitting right next to somebody and make sure that the masks are mandated, which I do believe that um, the Biden administration has passed that, that, that any travelers have to be masked. Um, and take the same precautions of, you know, hand washing and those things. And then, but still, I'm not going to a hotel. I'm not um, hanging out with a big group of people. Um, we're just kind of hanging out in her backyard, right. per se. So, I, I mean, in theory, if you and your friend wanted to, you know, hang out and not wear your masks, you know, you're kind of in the bubble together, right? Right. So you're both vaccinated. The, the risk to, to either of you, theoretically, is low. You're both vaccinated, 95% or better protection. Um, you're both healthy folks, that would probably be okay. But again, I think the the caveat here is 95% is not 100. And, you know, you don't know about that uncertainty around transmission. So right. You, and if you're boarding a plane, you don't know who else you're going to come yes. in contact with. So I think that's the other reason. And then the, the other thing, too, is when I come back, like I said, I do see my parents um, on most weekends. So I think when Bingo. I do come back, I probably will... Um, you know, practice the social distancing for a little bit uh, more and probably avoid, you know, hanging out in close proximity. Yeah, this is, to me, this is what the the world is going to look like for the better part of 2021, right? Mm -hmm. As we get more and more folks vaccinated, I think, you know, there's going to be a little bit of relaxation around some of those restrictions. We're going to see community numbers of COVID start to decline as they should as as the population gets more vaccinated. 
and probably there will be more businesses opening up and you'll start to see some gatherings of size start to occur again. But I think we have to continue to hammer the message that we need masks and we need social distancing at the very least until we get some good science and data to prove to us that transmission is not a concern after one has been vaccinated. Yeah, absolutely. But I am looking forward to going to Florida. (laughs) (laughs) Some sunshine. Good for you. All right. That's about all we have time for today. Asha, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Nick. It's always a pleasure. For sure. And I also want to remind the listeners to send along any questions or suggestions to our email address, which is podcast at beaumont.org. And Dr. Shah Jahan and I are always scouting out the best questions. And one of these days, we're going to do a mailbag episode. It may be when COVID settles down a little bit. We'll see. We leave you today with this healthy thought. We're all excited for the hope of a COVID-free world, and I think the vaccine is our path to victory. But we still need to take precautions of masking, social distancing, and hand washing, at least until we get to that magical number of 70 to 80 percent of our population being vaccinated. So till then, let's, let's just keep at it. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. So stay informed, talk to your doctor, and get vaccinated. Continue your journey to living a smarter, healthier life. Visit Beaumont.org slash podcast to access information and resources related to today's podcast.